Nobles Newsroom at 8 o'clock. Police are assessing comments a Conservative donor is said to have made about the MP Diane Abbott. Frank Hester's reportedly said she should be shot and makes him want to hate all black women. The Prime Minister says Mr Hester's words were racist and wrong. Our political editor Natasha Clarks told LBC pressure is now growing on the Tories to return the donation. The debate now we're talking about, about giving this money, is exactly what Number 10 have been trying to avoid having all day. Because once you admit that it is racist, it's not, it, it now resides on, well, are you going to give the money back? Is this guy a member of the Conservative Party? If so, why has he not been suspended, his membership revoked? Frank Hester has apologised but denies his comments were racist. Moscow claims Ukraine has launched a wave of attacks on targets within Russia's borders. There are unconfirmed reports of some Ukrainian forces entering enemy territory. A court in Romania has approved the extradition of social media influencer Andrew Tate to the UK. He and his brother will first be tried in Bucharest over prior accusations of rape and human trafficking, which they both deny. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed up at 78 points at 77.47. The pound buys a dollar 27 and a euro 17. LBC Weather with Ripple Energy. Climate action you can be proud of. Heavy rain moving into Northern Ireland and Scotland tonight. Drier in England and Wales, a low of six. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Charlotte Morgan. This is LBC from Global. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening and welcome to Tuesday's Cross Question. It's two minutes past eight. Uh, with us on the panel tonight, answering your questions, to my left name, Angela Eagle, Labour MP for Wallasey, who's a former Treasury Minister. Uh, to her left, Alexander Stafford, Conservative MP for Rother Valley. Uh, to my right, Grace Blakely, economist and political commentator, who's the author of the new book, Vulture Capitalism, which I'm brandishing <laughs> in front of the camera in a blatant plug. We'll have a few more of those during the programme. And Ian Birrell, who's an investigative journalist and and foreign correspondent. They are here to take your calls on 0345 6060 973. And don't forget to watch us on Global Player so you can see this beautiful book cover. Oh, Ian. Brilliant. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Now, I can't imagine what the subject of the first question will be, but David in Enfield is about to tell us. Hello, David. Good evening, everyone. Does the panel think that Frank Hester's alleged racist comments towards Diane Abbott will meet Michael Gove's new definition of extremism? That's almost an impossible question to answer because we don't actually know what that definition is because I think, I think it's going to be announced on Thursday. Um, Alexander Stafford, what a mess. Well, uh, yes. In a, in, a, in a summary, yes. Those comments clearly are racist, sexist, misogynistic, threatening and just plain wrong. In so so why, why couldn't Mel Stride and Graham Stewart use that word racist on the media this morning? Um, would you have used it had Rishi Sunak not used it about an hour ago? Yes, I, I, I look at the comments and they're racist. I, do, I think Hester has said that uh, he's debating whether he actually said it or not. I don't know about that, but... If those comments were said, those words said, they are clearly racist, they're clearly sexist. And to my view, there's no other way of doing it. I, I got no idea why someone would say something like that. What should the consequences be? Well, I would say, first of all, there needs to be a clear investigation into uh, what was said, when it was said. I gather he tried, or has tried to uh, apologise. But ultimately, if those comments said against Diane Abbott, it's almost up to her. Then she needs to say what she needs uh, him to do to make to make it better, and I think there should be a proper investigation by the party into into him. Do you think the money should be returned? I, I think if you look into an investigation to this, they should look into it. I think also we've got to see is the money still there? Has the money been spent? I don't know, uh, but it has. If it has, it hasn't been spent very well, has it? <laughs> well, I, I think everything should be should be looked at. Yeah. Um. Grace, let's come to you next. Um, th these political rows sort of bubble up from time to time and then after a few days th another event happens mm. and the, the news media uh, is dominated by something else. This seems to me to be on a different scale from the sort of inappropriate remarks that people have made in the past. Yeah, it's absolutely horrific and the kind of non-apology that was given just makes it far worse. But I think actually, Ian, you, know, you raise a really good point there, which is that we always treat these problems of kind of racist abuse as an issue of kind of one or two bad 
purples. It's one bad individual who said one bad thing. And then we don't look at the kind of systematic perpetuation of a culture of racism in major institutions, and particularly in this case, in the Conservative Party as a whole. Um, I don't think you can just say, oh, you know, it just so happens that we're seeing all of these random, you know, statements made from, you know, there have been lots of statements made by senior Conservative Party members, and they're all completely uh, separate from one another. And it just so happens that there's lots of bad people who happen to be racist. And in fact, you know, I think you can say this across a number of different institutions. And that issue of institutional racism is something that the Conservative Party has frequently said, oh, it doesn't exist. It's just, you know, uh, an individual moral failing. And that's actually, I think, the problem. And it's why we keep getting these scandals over and over again and nothing ever really done about it. But that was exactly what was said about the Labour Party and anti-Semitism, wasn't Well, no, it? I mean, exactly. That's the point, right? It's it's always a case that rather than seeing these as, as institutional issues that require um, communication, training, the, the dissemination of, of different ideas, uh, it's just like there's one bad guy at the top or there's one bad person who said one bad thing. And I never subscribed to that idea. I thought, yes, there's an, a problem of anti-Semitism, there's problems of racism, there's problem, problems of Islamophobia. How do you tackle that? It's by accepting that racism is a structural problem. It's actually foundational to, you know, much of our society. So how do we combat that? It is about talking to people, about engaging with people and undermining the stereotypes, the very harmful stereotypes upon which a lot of this stuff is based. Angela, what do you make of this? Um, I... I've been unable to believe that it's taken the Prime Minister all day until about 10 minutes before we came on here to finally get his spokesperson to admit that this was racist. It's the definition of racist to say that looking at a named person makes you hate all black women. Um, so not only is it racist, it's sexist and it incites violence um, because it, he said she should be shot. Now, um, he's not apologised for saying that he said he was rude about her so there has been no apology from him um and there's been no real apology he from says he's trying to phone her well, twice i'm not sure she, i'm not to. i'm not surprised she doesn't want to pick up the phone to somebody she, she's never met who has treated her like that um she will now be uh, as she always has been in her career and remember she's a pioneering um, the first black woman MP. She's a pioneer, whether you like her or not. She's due some respect. Uh, and why should she pick up the phone to somebody she's never met who has caused an, another huge pile on and made her feel unsafe? She said she feels frightened as a result of this. So, uh, you know, he hasn't apologised. Where's the professionalism, accountability and integrity that Rishi Sunak talked about? They should give the money back. And we should look also, I think, to see whether TPP, which is the company that he runs, uh, and him are fit and proper recipients of government contracts, NHS contracts. The NHS has a huge black workforce. If he's got that sort of attitude to black people and women, then it all needs to be looked at. And the minimum that the Tory party should do, if he's a member of the Conservative Party, is suspend him. I think he was the treasurer of the party at one stage. Um, he has an OBE. They should look at, at all of that. But they should certainly give the money back. Diane Abbott, at the end of her statement, said, I'm currently not a member of the Parliamentary Labour Party, but remain a member of the Labour Party itself. Yeah. So I'm hoping for public support from Keir Starmer. Which she got today. Which she got today. Is it not, Very strongly. Is it, wouldn't it be a sign of sort of a duty of care for him to readmit her to the parliamentary party? Well, we have an independent process uh, which is independently overseen by lawyers, which is ongoing, and that nobody, and I'm a member of the NEC, can, uh, can interfere in. So we, since since the anti-Semitism stuff... I don't think that's true in the case of the parliamentary party, is it? I mean, the, the, the chief whip or the leader can just readmit someone to the parliamentary party. But, yeah, but she's suspended pending this investigation, which is ongoing. So, I mean, I personally... But there's an act of kindness. I think surely that ought to be considered now, because she... I mean, if you read her statement... Um, I mean, I'm not trying to get an onion out of my pocket, but, I mean, she's clearly very upset by this, understandably so. Quite right. Yeah. Quite right. And there's a lot but of Would you like to see her come back? I, I, I personally... Oh, you can't say because you're on the NEC. I can't say because I'm on the NEC. I've always regarded Diane Abbott as a pioneer, as the first black woman MP who, as I said earlier, is due a lot of respect. I have a great deal of respect for her. <sighs>
Ian Beryl, what do you make of this? Well, obviously it's abhorrent, it's grotesquely racist. He, this won't have just been a one-off thing that he said. It's obviously his views, which is really disturbing. I think it also throws into perspective a bigger issue, which is the whole issue of party funding. Here's a guy who's given £10 million to the Tory party. Why do people like that give £10 million? Mm. He used to be a Green, now he's a Tory. We saw it with Bernie Ecclestone, who gave money to both the Tories and to Labour. Why do they do it? Because they want to get something back. He's a man who gets all his money Could from... Could be philanthropy. And you're it so cynical. For people. Then also we have a system whereby we know that these people end up in the House of Lords. We're about the only country in the world which actually legitimises corruption and mm. says if you give enough money, you can get a seat for per, per, for, for life in Parliament. Uh, I really hope that Keir Starmer is going to deal with this and deal with the obscenity of the House of Lords and all the party donors going in. But I think it really throws into question yet again the sleazy way that we fund politics in this country, the sleazy way that these people operate, the relationships of these sorts of people, and we need to just really look into this. Personally, I loathe the idea of state funding for parties, but I think it's the least bad option. But we just have a system which, which legitimises corruption, and that's what we're seeing again here. A guy who gets all his money from state contracts, mm. flips around the political parties, has what really abhorrent views, and he even lends Rishi Sunak, who's half as rich as him, his helicopter to use. You know, there's something fundamentally wrong in the way we fund politics in this country. The, the unspoken story here, in, not on this, but on party funding, is that I have yet to meet any politician, Labour, Conservative, Liberal Democrat, Green, SNP, whatever, who actually enjoys dealing with party donors. They absolutely loathe it. I don't know whether you, you can... Uh, whether you agree with that, Angela, but I, I suspect that if you get a call from Labour Party HQ saying, Angela, we'd quite like you to come and meet this group of donors, your heart slightly sinks. I mean, all I can say is, um, having visited Germany, where they do respect democracy because they nearly, well, they lost it for a while, they have a system of state funding there which I think works really well. And it also demonstrates that uh, the country itself has... Um, a, a commitment to en ensuring that democracy can be funded. Now, I know it's not popular, and you yourself said that you loathe the idea, but it is, in my view, by far the least worst option. It makes things transparent and fair, and it gets everybody away from this awful um, sort of hunt for money. Well, I mean, the other option is to have a, a mass political party that has support from members, from trade unions, from a kind of countervailing power that's capable of lobbying against the interests of the private sector, because at the moment we have this deep imbalance in every area of society where basically private capitalists are able to get their way over and over again within the state. Interestingly enough, I talk about this in the book um, with the example of, of Lex Greensill and his relationship with David Cameron yes. and actually his relationship with um, many different parts of the British state. This wasn't just about... Uh, you know, an individual politician and, uh, and a businessman. This man had uh, links with vast areas of the British state, used those to get NHS contracts, and then when his business was uh, potentially going to go under, used that to try and lobby for uh, for emergency funding, as did many businesses that we won't have heard about. So this is, as you mentioned, it's a question of corruption. We use corruption as a word that applies to kind of, you know, dark, impoverished countries over there, um, and we never actually recognise the ways in which those corrupt links between the public and private sector are used to promote the interests of, um, you know, mainly the wealthiest and most powerful people And by people the way, trade economy. union money mm. has virtually been legislated out of existence mm. by very, well, very... that's simply not what, true. No, I mean, by yes. very, you very... Unite, you unite giving very, millions no, to the Labour Party. No, they do not. By very, very one-sided... Uh, legislation which makes it virtually impossible for trade unions to now give money to the Labour Party. Well, I, so, I, 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 haven't, mean, I haven't got the list the, of party donations here, but the, most well, of the big trade unions are, are major donors to the Labour Party. Well, you'll find that the changes to the trade union legislation have made that much, 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 much harder, and it's been deliberately done to impoverish the Labour Party so that the Conservative Party can have a huge funding advantage, which they've Alexander, now got. Alexander, you wanted to come in? Oh, well, I was just going to reflect on uh, Grace's comment about uh, the, the mass unit. The trade unions do give significantly large funds to the Labour Party, so trade unions do give money. People do give money at all parties. I think and they've been relentlessly it, attacked. I, democratically and I, and I, and I decided as well. And democratically decided. 
that that money. It's not given by one bloke with abhorrent views. I mean, that is the thing. You know, we have this system of basically the cartelization of our political parties as they've been removed from their mass bases. Um, the people who are able to organize most effectively behind the scenes, the people with the most money, with the closest links to various different areas of the state, have gained this massive upper hand when it comes to lobbying our politicians and actually lobbying state institutions. It's no wonder that the vast majority of people feel as though they have no voice in our democracy because they basically don't. Just before we move on, um, in, in a previous life, you wrote speeches for David Cameron in opposition when he was determined to detoxify the Tory brand and made, I think, the Conservative Party far more attractive to people from different minorities. I mean, th this sort of thing, I mean, both of these stories this week, Lee Anderson and this one, I mean, there'll be lots of people listening to this programme who who are from an ethnic minority background who may have voted Conservative in one or two of the, the previous elections, but just now think, well, I can't do that anymore. I mean, David Cameron, I, I don't know which part of the world he's in at the moment as far as Secretary, but I mean, he must say all that work for nothing. We've got to a point where we've got more people from ethnic minorities in the cabinet than ever before. That wouldn't have happened without those measures. It's true. And also, I mean, Saeed Awasi has been very strong about Islamophobia within mm. the party, you know, the acceptable dinner party racism, as she called it very rightly. There is a real problem, I think, still within the Conservative Party, reflecting wider problems in society to do with racism, to do with Islamophobia. Uh, and we don't, they don't crack down on it enough. But it's, it's, a, it's a wider problem, I think, within society. And we could touch on other issues also, you know, let's look at the attitudes towards people with disabilities, mm. the, the minority we never talk about, who are still probably the most excluded minority in this country. And we never hear anything. But what we do hear all the time from now the Conservative Party is this attack on the idea that diversity training and a little bit of money is a terrible thing. And we hear that local government's in a bad state this week because of a few, you know, a little bit of money going on diversity training. Well, actually, I think maybe we need a bit more diversity training, clearly, in a lot of places, because we've got such problems across society. I, I, just simply, this calculation is not true. Look at the Conservative uh, government at the moment. It's one of the most, diver the most diverse government that has ever been. We have an, an Asian, uh, Asian background uh, Prime Minister. Uh, the w Minister for Women Equality is a black woman. We've had Asian chancellors. We have black chancellors. We are the most diverse party. We've not even, had, we've even kind of... had, dare I say, women leaders, not which the Labour Party has not had. Not socially diverse. I think this is the Conservative Party is actually the most diverse, the most reflective party of modern Britain out Why there. Why can't and we've it got call out racism that. when it sees it then? Why has it taken the Prime Minister all day after sending out two ministers, including mm. Mel Stride, who was his campaign manager, to make fools of themselves on the television this morning, denying that what Hester said was mm. actually racist? But that, it is clearly racist. We've said that. But what I'm saying is the Conservative Party does not have this problem because look at the, the Cabinet. We, have, we are the most reflective of modern British body of any, of any the party out problem there. with tokenism and well, with the idea. I don't it say, I don't say having, the, having the first Asian heritage this is actually of tokenism. Arguably, that's exactly correct. No, but the, the idea tokenism. of tokenism, which is it's, that you can place, you know, people from ethnic minorities, women in positions of power, and then well, say, placed, we don't have any problem there's with there's racism a, because, look, we've got well, people from ethnic minorities in positions of power. They've earned their places. Nothing placed there. These people are the best and brightest in their field, and they've earned their places. But what you're saying is that we can't be racist because we have people from ethnic minorities in positions of power, which is just wrong. It's the same absurd no, kind of no, thinking as when... No, what I'm saying when... is we we're not institutionally racist because people, age, age, Asian people, minority people, thrive in the Conservative Party, rise to the very top of the Conservative Party. What you, what I'm you not just said there is we can't apples. be institutionally racist because we have people from ethnic minorities people in, ethnic in minorities senior thrive, positions. Thrive that's in the, Conservative the Party. problem because it, it doesn't look at the foundations of these inequalities and it, it kind of, you know, the whole Conservative policy is to deride the idea of institutional racism as kind of, you know, this is the the thing that we've got in the US where institutional racism is is cultural Marxism and it's all a big conspiracy designed to, um, you know, uh, basically kind of undermine uh, certain voices within society. And like, that is the problem. If you can't admit to the idea of institutional okay. racism, then everything there is by definition. There are lots of other subjects to cover, which we will do so over the next 40 minutes. It's 20 past eight. This is LBC.
23 minutes past eight. Grace Blakely, Ian Birrell, Dame Angela Eagle and Alexander Stafford are with us answering your questions. Scott is in Norwich. Hello, Scott. Uh, good evening, Ian. Good evening, panel. Um, my question is, uh, should Rishi Sunak be bold and call the election for the 2nd of May? That would be a very bold decision at the moment, <laughs> wouldn't it? Um, let's also take one from Martin in Doncaster, which is slightly related. Martin, go ahead. Yeah, the question is, is could Boris Johnson be Richie Sunak's answer to Taylor Swift? Now, <laughs> Taylor Swift, I'm told, endorsed Joe Biden and helped him win the last election. Uh, now, the Times reported this morning that Boris Johnson is expected to return and campaign in the Red Wall, that's your area, Alexander, isn't it, to help turn around Rishi Sunak's political fate. Um, take either or both of those. Angela, let's come to you first. Well, um, I, Nadine Doris said that it wasn't true and that um, Rishi Sunak and Boris John hadn't spoken for uh, a year. So I, I suspect that it's just one of those stories that surfaces every now and again. I mean, you know... I think we have to remember that Boris Johnson was hounded out of um, government by his own party. 60 of his own um, uh, ministers resigned after the Pincher appointment and his serial uh, sort of treatment and lack of serious treatment of serious things. Um, you know, he, he, he lost two ethics advisers, he lost his anti-corruption czar, he lied to Parliament. The Privilege Committee said that he had to have a 90-day suspension, so he resigned and ran away rather than face a recall petition. But if, why if, if would, he walked why down would your high bringing street, him back... If he walked down your high street, he would be mobbed by people because he still... Ha <clears throat> in a particular way in Wallasey, I suspect. I'm well, not, I'm well, not I sure don't know. But I'm I, not sure I, I, that well, they'd well, in welcome Alexander's him. constituency, I imagine <laughs> you would rather welcome him. I, I, visiting, I would, would welcome you? with open arms uh, Boris helping in the, the, the party out. We had actually Rishi Sunak out in Maltby, the first time Prime Minister ever visited Maltby uh, last Thursday, went to speak to people at the Weatherspoons, and actually he was mobbed as well. We did a little walk around did, the high street. Didn't he just speak to party members? I was told he didn't they speak to them all. No, no, half half he didn't dare go outside. No, he went to the vintage people. booth. Really on, he, bored. Bored. he went to a vintage booth, uh, got a sandwich there, and he went to the spoons. So it was very, very well. But you don't received. get many Tory members in Weatherspoons. Uh, yeah. Unless they're carefully what do you mean? selected. <laughs> Unless they're carefully selected <laughs> and were there in advance. But possibly. on the actual question about. So uh, he didn't look happy being there in the photographs well, I saw. Well, they were very pleased at You see the pictures online of him out down the street. They were great. Uh, but one the wider question about the general election, I don't think there's any call for general election, really. In May, the Prime Minister really? made it clear. Uh, no, well, no do, do you never listen it. to LBC? Do you never listen to all the people, people calling and demanding an, an immediate general election? I keep he, trying to explain it doesn't work like that. <laughs> it is in the Prime Minister's gift. He's not doing anything bad by <laughs> not having an election on the 2nd of May, but he'd be mad too politically. We all know this is the Labour Party talking up election in May. The, the Prime Minister made it very clear at the beginning of the year it's going to be the second half of the year. That's what we're going to do. We made it clear so everyone has time to prepare on all sides. I think that's the right thing. I don't think the country wants or needs a general election. I think what he should right do is call it for want... August the 15th or something and ruin everyone's summer holiday. But, I mean, the country does want a general election. It's 14 years of failure. We were on our third prime minister in two years. There's total chaos in the government. Well, Nothing not. really effective has been done since 2016 and all the Brexit stuff. And I just think people are fed up of it and they okay. want a renewed mandate for Ian. whichever government is going to take office. Y yeah, I think we should have an election as soon as possible, but I despair because we're not going to have the big issues that we need to talk about mm -hmm. in the election. We can already see it. Uh, it's just the most dismal political debate going on, which is failing the country on both sides of the political divide. We're not talking about the really important issues. We're not talking about the huge problems we have with defence, how we're going to defend the country with the Russian threat. We're not talking about social... We were last we night. We spent an hour doing Great. exactly that. No, no, you may be, but in terms of the political debate... <laughs> That's all I can do. We're not talking about... <laughs> The, um, we're not talking about social care, we're not talking about really what's happening with the prisons crisis, which we're hearing about today, where there's early release going on. All we hear from both political parties is, isn't this terrible, we need to lock up more people, when actually we need to halve the prison population and deal with recidivism. Uh, there are so many issues that we're not dealing with, we're just hearing that the Scottish drug deaths have gone up another 10%. Which we're doing after 9 o'clock. Which is great, now. but we're not talking about the fact that we, but, need, to, uh, we need a different approach to how, drug policy. There's actually, so many issues not being talked about. That is true. True, but isn't that the fault, in large part, of the media who will concentrate on a lot of the fluff? 
And I, I, don't, I don't exclude I think myself. A lot of the right, sometimes debate, I do. I think a lot of the political debate is really reductive and terrible. Uh, but it, it's the politicians who are going to lead it. The media can raise these issues. I keep raising them. You keep raising them. But they don't get debated because the politicians are fearful of talking about the really big issues. How are we going to fund health care for the future? How are we going to deal with social care? How are we going to fund defence? They just don't talk about these issues. How are we going to fund, afford the prisons? And, you know, and then we raise the issue of Boris Johnson, who's done more to demean democracy than pretty much anyone in recent history. The idea that he's some kind of salvation for the Tory party is a joke. Uh, so, yeah, let's have an early election just to get it over with, because we're not going to get the big issues debated with. Uh, and hopefully after the election, maybe then we can try and raise these issues and get them talked about again. Okay. But I just think we have real political failure going on in this country, which is why so many people are so hacked off with the political class with Westminster and yes the media do share the blame. Chris? People are hacked off and people want an early election quite simply because they basically a lot of them cannot afford to put food on the table at this point. If you go and speak to people and ask them what are the issues we want to see tackled in this election it's the cost of living crisis and public services and is that a surprise? Absolutely not. You know there has been very little that has been done to alleviate the impact um, on people's uh, on people's incomes over the cost of living crisis and that bear in mind comes on the back of a decade of wage stagnation because we've had very low levels of economic growth. We have still relatively high levels of inequality. The government has prioritised tax breaks for the rich, bailing out massive corporations and has done very little for working people. We've had long-term austerity. Our public services are decimated. People are just you know, you can't get an appointment with a GP. People are languishing on waiting lists. They can't get major surgeries. I think there is a collective kind of disbelief at the state of the NHS at this point. The Conservatives obviously bear the blame for that. But the thing I'm most concerned about in this election is that Labour does not have a plan for dealing with our public services. And if you look at the fiscal credibility rule combined with their refusal to say that they will raise taxes on the wealthier on corporations, there is this question of how are you going to uh, cover these, uh, these funding shortages in our public services? The Tories have pumped money into the NHS. So let's the NHS has undergone the, NHS, the longest it's so real term it's funding all. squeeze in its history. It's also had so much more money put into it, while social care has actually had money. Well, you social care right. has, all, has you, also you, you, you is say in it's a been worse squeeze, state. and you say it's had more money than ever. But who, I mean, well, it in real right. terms, when you account for demand and uh, the real is how pay, do we fund it's the had the, the issue is how do we fund a sort of health service that we want in this country when we've got an ageing society, we've got a failed social care system which is putting such pressure on it. We've got all these issues going on and we're not addressing well, them. Which we is might, we might, well, we might, we might, we might, we might, we might, we might, we might get a question on that later, so you, you never know. I mean, mental uh, health keep, services keep are in total disrepair. And yet Don't disagree, but I've got to go so to the news, I've got well. to go to the news. 0345 6060 973. And after the news, I'm going to ask Grace about this endorsement she's got from Naomi Klein on the front cover of her book. A galvanising takedown, it reads. The question is, can a takedown be galvanised? What on earth does that even mean? <laughs> it's only part so of the question. Stay quote, tuned Ian. for I'll that. Read the whole thing. It's 8 32 <laughs> news headlines with Charlotte Morgan. The Metropolitan Police say they're in contact with the MP Diane Abbott following comments made by Frank Hester. It's claimed the major Tory party donor said she made him want to hate all black women and should be shot. The businessman has apologised but denies making racist remarks. Children will no longer be prescribed puberty blockers for gender identity issues on the NHS in England. It's after a review found there was a lack of evidence and data collected on their long-term effects. And Romania has agreed to extradite the social media influencer Andrew Tate to the UK following his trial there. He and his brother Tristan deny claims of rape and human trafficking in the country. LBC weather. Heavy rain moving into Northern Ireland and Scotland overnight. Drier for England and Wales with a low of six. A mix of sunny spells and blustery showers in the north tomorrow. Cloudy but dry to the south. A high of 15. LBC.
8.36, Grace Blakely, who is the author of this book, Vulture Capitalism. That's the last plug it's going to get on the programme. <laughs> but um, galvanising takedown doesn't really work, does it? Well, I mean, the longer quote from <laughs> Naomi Klein, which I was incredibly starstruck to receive because I always looked up to her um, as a, a kind of young activist, uh, is is a really great endorsement. So I'm very pleased to have that. Um, but yeah, I mean... I haven't even put it on the back of the book. Honestly, what are your publishers thinking she of? She says it's a galvanising takedown of neoliberalism's free market logic because I'm taking apart the idea that capitalism is a free market system that guarantees freedom of democracy freedom and democracy because as we've heard already there are these this okay. toxic fusion between public and private power in service and Angela Eagle you've been doing this for the last 20 years at least haven't Fairly you? Fairly obviously true <laughs> <laughs> Alexander Stafford is with us Conservative MP for Rother Valley and uh, investigative journalist and foreign correspondent Ian Birrell let's go to Simon in Edgware hello Simon Good evening Ian Evening. My question is a two-part question. In the light of the fact that today the British Army is the smallest it's been since the Napoleonic Wars and the threats that we face from China, Russia and Iran, does the panel agree that we need to rearm and build our defence as quickly as, as possible to face what, I can, what they may consider and I consider to be the biggest threat since the 1930s. And the second part of my question is, does the panel agree that NATO is now more important today than it's ever been since 1945 and that GDP should be around 5% as opposed to the current 2.5%? So it's a two-part question. Right. Now, last week, the Public Accounts Committee of MPs warned the government has no credible plan for funding the armed forces, which might have a budget shortfall of as much as £29 billion. However, the government responded to say it simply doesn't recognise the Public Accounts Committee's claims as being accurate. Um, Ian Beryl, I know you could talk for the next 22 minutes till the end of this hour on this subject, but um, let's try and fit your answer into two and a half minutes. Yeah, well, I agree with both points being made. I think we have uh, a real problem. Uh, if you talk to senior military people, they are expecting us to... Uh, there's a very high chance that we are going to go to war with Russia at some point in the future years. They expect it to probably come through the Baltic states, some kind of uh, attack coming through there. They're looking at the best ways to move troops around Europe, if it's going to come through the south, through the middle, through the north. And I think we do need to wake up to the fact that we have... Uh, a war of ages going on at the moment between autocracies with China, Russia, Iran and North Korea trying to take on democracies. And that's what the war in Ukraine is about, where I've spent so much of the last couple of years. It is a war between democracy and, and uh, dictatorship. If we, we're haven't so done, we haven't done nearly enough to support. I think Biden has been scared, really, of Ukraine beating Russia. They've done enough to stop them losing. To stop them losing, Ukraine has been amazing the way they've captured back half their territory, the way they're winning the sea battle despite not having a navy, and uh, we should be doing far more to support them. But uh, I think we do need to put mu much more money into defence. The problem is that so much of our defence spending historically has been misspent. The procurement has been scandalously yeah. bad. Uh, it's gone into the wrong things. It's gone into uh, aircraft carriers we don't need. We have ended up with an army which is far too small and which can't do the job. And I think we do need to wake up to the threat that we're facing because I think there's a very real chance that we are going to end up in a serious conflict in the forthcoming years. And the best way to stop that is to beef up our own defences and to do what other countries are doing. France has beef, has agreed to spend a third more on its, on its defences. Germany is spending more. Uh, we're becoming an outlier and we need to work out how we're going to do it. Do we need to set up a stronger territorial army? Do we need to do something to prepare citizens? But we do need to face up to the reality that we live in a world which is changing. We're seeing this around the world. We're seeing this in Africa. We're seeing this in Asia. We're seeing this in uh, Europe, of course. And we need to prepare for, the, for this readiness because there is a possibility that we're going to end up in a conflict situation over forthcoming years. Angela Eagle, if Labour get in at the next election, do you think this is one of the major issues that's going to face a Labour government? And uh, what do you make of what of Ian's analysis? Well, I don't disagree with Ian's analysis of the potential threats that we're facing in Europe from Russia. That's why it's really, really important that we try to beef up support for Ukraine, because um, if... 
if Putin triumphs in Ukraine, he won't stop there. He didn't stop in Crimea and he won't stop in Ukraine. I think that the prospect of a Trump presidency with the implications that there may be for um, American funding of NATO is also uh, extremely troubling. And we've seen the way that the partisan use of a blocking mechanism for the aid for Ukraine that the Republican majority in the House is using at the moment is being used to assist uh, Putin. So I think it's a much darker period potentially that we're in than we've been in during my political life. And we've got to prepare for that. Some of that is about making sure that NATO is much more interoperative between the different countries in it, because it's not good enough at the moment. And certainly if America were to exit or reduce its commitment, that would be a disaster. And I think we've got to think much more carefully about the values that we're supporting. And those are values of democracy, values of having a liberal uh, f uh, state where you can have freedoms to say what uh, you like. Uh, within the boundaries that you have in democracies. And we have to look at the threat from autocracies, which is growing, which is what Ian has mentioned. Now, uh, he's also right that the way that procurement has been done in the um, armed forces is a disgrace. I mean, the idea that the government could say it doesn't recognise an NAO report. The NAO is full of experts that do a great deal of work. Um, so there's obviously a lot to improve and a lot that we've got to do. And I know uh, from the work that's being done on our front bench that if we were to be privileged enough to win the next election, that would be taken extremely seriously. Alexander Stafford, do you think there is a public appetite even for, to have the debate? I remember w when the head of the army came out with that quote about, well, we might need to consider conscription with a pre-war generation. Everyone thought, oh my goodness. And we did a phone-in saying, would you be prepared to fight for your country? And interestingly, about half of the callers said, yes, if we were going to be invaded. But the other half said, I'm not fighting for Estonia. And I think that there, there, there is... is a, <coughs> There are, there are echoes mm. of the 1930s here. Well, well, yes, and there's that famous debate in the, in the Oxford Union in the 1930s about would you, like, fight for your king and country, and the majority of people at Oxford said, no, they wouldn't. And then a few years later, people were fighting for king and country. Uh, I think at the moment, uh, it is right, we need to make our public aware that there is a huge danger uh, whether from China, whether it's from R Russia or out there, I think we are, the world is in an awfully dark place at the moment and it's only going to get darker. I think we do need to increase spending um, up to, well, going up to 2.5%, we want up to 3% and even more. Uh, we need to prepare our defences, but at the same time we need to make sure we have the right sort of kit. It's very easy to sit here and say we need more uh, troops, and more tanks, and more planes, which I obviously want as well. But the nature of warfare is changing and what we've seen in uh, Ukraine uh, is actually where you've got the right kit, you can stop the other Russian bear and it's about having the right technology as well and that technology is very expensive. The use of drones, whether it's naval drones or aerial drones, is actually completely changing warfare. And I think when we talk to the public about war and the future of war, I think most public have a, in their images of their minds sort of tanks across the sort of East German plain, whereas actually modern warfare, especially against Russia, is so radically different that we need to actually sort of gear people up and actually have a conversations about what does the future of warfare look like with the technology? Although it is still trenches and tanks. Yes, I mean, yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no question. But the the trouble is, even having this debate, people accuse you of talking up the possibility of war, mm -hmm. which I suspect, Grace, you might have some sympathy with. What I think is that politicians absolutely love spending loads of time talking up the potential of war and talking about guns and weapons because it makes them feel big and powerful and strong and it projects an image of strength that people like. But actually, there was a report that was released not long ago uh, that said that the biggest military threat, one of the biggest military threats that um, Britain and many other d advanced countries face is actually the threat of climate change in terms of the impact that's going to have on refugees, in terms of resource wars, in terms of the impact it will have on relationships between countries in very fractious parts of the world. It's very easy for politicians to go ahead and say, oh, we're going to buy loads of guns because this terrible thing is going to happen to us. And yet we are on the brink of what is undoubtedly the biggest threat to humanity in modern history. And no one wants to do anything about that. I mean, can I say that I think that um, in a modern, um, well-adjusted democracy, you need to be aware of all of these kinds of threats. The climate threat is really, really important, and you're quite right to talk about it. So is the threat of another pandemic partially caused by the fact uh, that the climate is changing the way it is, that the 
got the the, the uh, permafrost is melting. That all sorts of nasties are getting out because of that. Any kind of decent government that uh, is looking to protect its people and create resilience has got to be monitoring all those threats and preparing to deal with them in practical ways. But the difference is, of course, we could be facing a threat within the next five mm. years yeah. of Russia attacking somewhere like Estonia. Yeah. And the other thing we should be doing, which I think is really missing from this whole debate, is if you go to Finland, Finland has the most faith in politics of any society in the world. Finland also has the most trust in the media of any society. It also, from a very early age, teaches kids how to deal with technology. It teaches them how to look for disinformation. It teaches them how to interrogate facts. And it's incredible if you go there and see it. It seems to me so obvious that we should be mimicking this approach and teaching kids from a very early age, how do you handle this world of technology where there's so much misinformation out there? Because that's part of our defense as well. And it's really striking when you see that in every aspect of their schooling, in art, they teach them to examine propaganda, they teach them how to understand algorithms, they teach them how to understand technology. And they even challenge things like Wikipedia. So you go and talk to the kids and they say, well, yeah, we'll use Wikipedia, but we'll always check the sources. Well, I'll tell you what, as a result of so, that... This is so essential for what we should be doing as well. But no one talks about how do we arm our kids to live in this world where disinformation is such an important weapon. I used to do a show on CNN with the new president of Finland, so I'm going to get him on to talk about all the Great. things it's that fantastic you, you just what said. they do. Right, we'll move on in just a moment. It's 8.47. This is LBC.
8.52, Grace Blakely, Ian Birrell, Dame Angela Eagle and Alexander Stafford with us taking your calls. And text, here's a text question from Phil. More than 9 million people in this country haven't got a job and aren't even looking for a job. If we've got a shortage of workers, surely the answer lies in getting these people off their sofas and into work. <coughs> now, according to figures from the ONS, more than a fifth of working age adults in the UK are deemed not to be actively looking for work. I imagine this might be something you cover in your book, Grace. Yeah, this is uh, a problem that has become much more significant since the pandemic. And a big part of this increase, the statistical increase in the number of economically inactive people has come from older people who have uh, often got COVID and then not, often not been able to go back to work because they have issues surrounding long COVID. There's also a massive issue here with mental health. Uh, the waiting list to get basic treatment for often very severe mental health issues are just astounding. Um, there are people, and, you know, people will be familiar with this issue because you will see on the streets people who very obviously have just kind of extremely severe mental health issues, things like schizophrenia, who are not being treated. They're often being dealt with by other public services, taking up a lot of time from the police uh, when actually they need care. Um, and this is, I think, a big, big challenge for our society. We've talked about social care already. There is a complete lack of care, whether we're talking about, you know, adult social care, children's social care, uh, mental health care. There aren't enough nurses. There isn't enough investment in these services. And that is what is meaning that people are becoming chronically ill and they are unable to go back to work. I don't think anybody's suggesting that people in that position should go back well, to work I mean, because you know, they're not able often, to. But... It is impossible to believe that a fifth of the working population is, I mean, particularly when we have lots of jobs available, people don't want to work. And I think there were people after the pandemic who decided that just from a lifestyle point of view, they quite liked the fact that they didn't go into work every day and maybe cut down their work from two, so five days to two or whatever. Yeah, I think... But there will be people in amongst that group, and we've seen all the stories about people who are able to claim benefits even though they are capable of working. Now, I don't know what proportion there are, but it's, it's not going to be a, a small number, this, is it? No, this um, has been massively tightened. If you actually speak to people who are in this position of, you know, going through the often humiliating process of having to claim job seekers allowance, you have to turn up to specified appointments at the job centre. And if you don't, you get sanctioned. And we know that sanctions have been linked to people dying uh, because they've literally been un unable to feed themselves. There's a massive problem here with disabled people as well um, who are put through these humiliating processes to test whether or not they're actually able to work. And you say it's not believable that, you know, 20% of the population is actually unable to work. And, you know, it might not be all of those people, but there is this epidemic of mental ill health. It, show up, it shows up in the male suicide figures. Um, it shows up in, uh, you know, just the number of people who are, you know, put in prison on the streets, like dealing with these very, very severe problems. It shows up in the health okay. service. Alexander. Mm. Well, clearly, there's a huge problem with getting me back to work, and it's quite a complex issue. I think there's no one silver bullet for this. I think, first of all, it is actually good for people to work. I want people to work, and people should work uh, <coughs> completely. It's good for your mental, physical, and social health as well as earning money. It's very important. It sends clearly good messages. Now, as you said, Ian, there's people who clearly were in the pandemic just are not coming back to the workforce. Uh, we have an issue with older people and the government and kind of we need to do more to get older people in work. We should tell people and help people to get to work. But we also need to help people with disabilities get jobs. And I'm tired of some of this attitude or often that oh, people are, are ill, they, they, they can't work. A lot of uh, people with disabilities, whether it's physical or mental uh, disabilities, want to get back to, uh, to work. And we as the government, but also need to work with employers to make sure they can get back to work. And actually one thing we have seen uh, during the pandemic is a lot more working from home and actually that is a great way of getting more people with disabilities into the workplace if they can work from home they might have the setup at home which is good but we need to do more to encourage them because fundamentally it is good for people to work but to is it a work. case of encouragement or effectively dragooning people back to work because there are some people who think the benefits should be withdrawn from anyone who is capable of working but refuses to well if there's job vacancies that people can do and people refuse to do those job vacancies and they're able to do they should be put to work. We have. A, I mean, my advice surgery is full of people who've been sanctioned or want to work and can't and aren't given the right sort of support. So I don't think that a life on benefits is actually very nice to have. Um, there's a lot of myths about it. What we've got to do is create circumstances where people who have, have got limited abilities, be it, it, it um, because of mental illness or 
or disability can actually contribute. And for that, we need to have a much more sympathetic workplace environment. And we have to have a lot of support and help for them. And of course, that doesn't come cheap. There's also this question around childcare. Um, because I know a lot of people of my age who are basically like women, they've had a kid, it's not, they live in London, it's not worth them going back to work because the costs of childcare are absolutely astonishing. And the wages are so low often, the wages you are can't low. make it work economically. Um, Rosie says, Ian, I'm 61. I don't claim anything. I'm desperate to work, but no one wants me. I'm too old. Well, Rosie, I'm 61 as well. And I'm lucky that I do have a, a job that I really enjoy. Um, but there, there is something somewhere, out, something out for you out there somewhere. Not everybody writes people off in their 60s. Well, I hope they don't anyway. But that, I, that, I, I might need a new job at some point. Who knows, Ian? Well, just talking about the mental health and about uh, disabilities, what's the percentage of people with learning disabilities work? I think it's about 8%. 8%. The reason is because we have such a prejudicial society that people think they can't work. Actually, I know of projects which are uh, helping them into work and they're really successful. So there are also societal attitudes towards people with disabilities that need to change. Mental health, you say there's not enough money being spent. I would beg to differ. I would say actually the problem is it's being spent in the wrong way. We have a mental health system whereby it's focused very much on CB, on very uh, mild therapy at one end. All the community services have been winnowed out over the last 20 years. And then we have a system which relies on restraint and locking people up. We're putting more and more people into secure, into secure systems, often privatised at great expense. They're terrible. Uh, they shouldn't be relying on restraint. We use more restraint than a lot of societies, and it's very expensive. What we should be doing is getting rid of this system which relies on restraint. Ideally, I'd love to follow the Italian system, which which makes this illegal, and rely on far more community services, which are far more based on therapy. They're far cheaper. They're within the community, and we'd actually end up with a much better system of mental health care rather than what we have at the moment, which is failing so badly. Right, we've reached the time for our fun question from Bella in Exeter. The Olivier Awards are... Was it Olivier Awards? Are, nominations are out, with Nicole Scherzinger getting one for her role in Sunset Boulevard. So come on then, panel... What's your favourite musical? And if you aren't a fan of musicals, I still want your favourite one. Everyone must have a favourite one, mustn't they, Grace? Moulin Rouge. Never seen that it. counts, doesn't it? That does count, Yeah, I yes. think so, yeah. yeah. Have you seen it? I love it. I've seen it loads of times. Always, you know, belt out the songs. Yeah. Go on. Do you want me to give you an example? No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Ian. I'm not a huge fan because I always find it slightly weird the way they suddenly start singing halfway through and the songs never seem to fit very well. But the one I d did like was Cabaret, which, of course, has resonance for the society we're living in these days. Right. Alexander? Well, I couldn't be a politician without saying Jesus Christ Superstar. <laughs> take from that what you mean. <laughs> I will. Uh, Not sure what to take from that. No, Angela. Uh, Wizard of Oz, Cabaret, Top Hat no, just and for Funny that. Girl. Just one would be enough. <laughs> well, and I'm all the rest in between. I'm nominating chess because I've seen it 15 times and it's absolutely brilliant. Thank you all very much indeed. Uh, let me tell you who's on the programme tomorrow. We have uh, former sports minister Tracy Crouch, the Liberal Democrats Home Affairs spokesperson Alistair Carmichael, the political commentator Matthew Stadlin and the Daily Telegraph's chief political correspondent Camilla Turner. But coming up in the next hour, we're going to turn our attention, which we have done quite a lot on this programme over the years, to the issue of drug deaths in Scotland, particularly, well, drug deaths generally, but particularly in Scotland, because they've gone up again. I mean, it surged, actually. There were 1,197 suspected drug deaths between January and December 2023, 10% more than during the same period the previous year. The Scottish Government has been told well-meaning words won't stop people dying, and yet the SNP say that their plans are working. Well, how can they be working if yet again the figures have gone up. So what to do about this really serious issue which makes drug, drug deaths in Scotland the worst in the whole of Europe. On your radio, on Global Player and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. 
From Global's newsroom, the Prime Minister says alleged comments made by a Tory party donor about Diane Abbott were racist and wrong. Businessman Frank Hester has apologised after he reportedly said she should be shot and makes him want to hate all black women. He's denied making racist remarks, though. Downing Street's facing criticism for taking so long to describe them as such. Labour MP and former Treasury Minister Angela Eagle has told Cross Question there was little to consider. I've been unable to believe that it's taken the Prime Minister all day and to finally get his spokesperson to admit that this was racist. It's the definition of racist.